All right, so um, just a couple of quick announcements I posted about, uh, but there are these Canvas activities um, that um, finally um, put together, um, one on chapter six, D5, and the other on chapter seven, uh, D7, that uh, one of them's due uh, next week, uh, I think maybe even Tuesday, so over the weekend, the other one is due about a week after that. And they, along with adding those two Canvas activities, I've now increased the drop so that before you would, it would automatically drop to your two lowest, and now it'll drop your three lowest. So uh, if this one came up too quickly for you, you can forget that it's there and pretend like we were on the old drop two policy and just focus on this one uh, as an example. Um, thanks for those who've already completed D5. That's helped me debug things. I've got some fill in the blank sort of things in there and I always uh, am not as creative in the answers. And so there's always alternative forms of correct answers that I leave out and it's auto graded. And so I have to tell Canvas all of the answers ahead of time. So whenever someone gets a mark uh, taken off for giving an answer that I haven't thought about, I then go in and re-add it for everybody else. And so it's great to have, um, I appreciate those of you who went in and dived right into it and finished it ahead of time because that helped me find some of those. Um, homework D2 has been available. Uh, I'm working on getting homework D7 out there, and then that will be the last homework assignment. And so we'll have uh, four homework assignments total. And remember the, uh, the drop policy, there's a drop one lowest uh, homework policy that is uh, new relative to what was originally on the syllabus. And so if you didn't like your earlier uh, uh, you know, homework B1 grade, then you can you know, make sure to complete homework D7 and do well, and that'll get dropped. Uh, then that's all of the grades really aside from the final exam, these homeworks and these Canvas activities left over here. So then the final exam is this multi-stage thing that we've talked about. It'll be for the, the last week of classes there. I also posted something that um, I want to make sure that, you know, this is on Zoom and I know some of you have been coming to office hours and that's great. I've heard some of you for the first midterm form study sessions and you were organizing in Slack and that's really wonderful. And I want to encourage that. I know it's hard to connect with people and if you're not meeting in a classroom and bumping into each other and, you know, and those sorts of things. And so uh, a lot of people don't, students don't realize this, but if you go into the people section, um, you know, and then go to the group tab on Canvas, then you can actually create your own student group that you can invite other students from the class to join, or you can leave it up there and have other people be able to join the group. It'll see the group exists and then they can be joined into it and you can join multiple groups. It's not really, you know, there's like, you know, once you get into the group, you can, you've got your own discussion board, you can do it's a couple of collaboration things. There's some tools that are available. They're not really that exciting. I mean, you could do it with Slack or whatever, but I guess what's nice about it is it's sort of a central clearinghouse for everyone to advertise that they have these groups available. So if you're looking for like, you really want somebody to like to reach out and study with, um, then I encourage you to create a study group and you can then post something to the discussion board or to the Slack channel and say, hey, I formed a study group. If you're interested in joining, then join it on uh, and Canvas and then maybe we can, um, you know, you can either do asynchronous communication via the discussions or you can try to work out a time to work together. Um, or maybe when you do the stage two exam, that second stage of the exam, you'll have a group that you can work on that group together. And so you can maybe form those groups ahead of time. So that's the reason why I posted that there to try to encourage you to form these groups um, in, the, you know, and if there's anything else I can do to help you guys find each other, um, then just let me know. All right, so any questions about those announcements before we start on new work? Okay. Great. All right, well then I'll shift the share. One second. Good. Okay. Um, reorganize my mission control here. All right, that'll do. All right, so. 
so far, we've been talking about non-renewable resources, uh, specifically privately owned non-renewable resources using oil as kind of a focal example. You could also use coal. Um, you could probably uh, natural gas would fit into this as well. And, um, and we've generally found that the incentives in the natural markets for privately owned non-renewable resources are going to naturally uh, encourage conservation. Um, with the interest rate being uh, kind of a benchmark for, for how much conservation it, people are going to naturally do on their own. So if you increase interest rates, then you're making it more profitable to shift your assets from natural resources into cap into money, monetary resources. And um, if you lower the interest rates, you're going to encourage people to maintain their natural resources. So low interest rate scenarios actually encourage conservation. Um, and so that's kind of one of the kind of interesting insights there. And we started um, on, and, and I'll just, you know, do, you know, as a reminder, we'll do a little example that'll be similar to the homework. So this is a similar to homework example. In one of these, um, you know, we've got a non-renewable a non-renewable resource where if we um, if we assume that the total available across the market is, um, you know, T equal, we'll say to 10 in this example. And if we assume a discount rate or otherwise known as an interest rate, of 20%, and that corresponds to a marginal rate of substitution of one divided by 1.2, which if I do one divided by 1.2, I get 83%. So that's a beta equal to um, 0.833. Um, so that's the context that we're solving for here. And we're gonna say that the market views this resource with a uh, demand or marginal benefit curve which I'm gonna say is equal to say 15 minus Q and the extraction cost. So I'll say the supply curve, which is equal to the marginal cost of extraction, we're gonna say equal to five. And so this means that if it's oil, then for every gallon of oil that I pull out of the ground, this is how much it costs for me to run that pump to pump that gallon of oil out of the ground. And I'm just assuming that regardless of how much I've pumped or how much I have left, it's always the same marginal cost. Every gallon costs that much to me. So if I wanted to do the myopic or static or one period, these are all synonyms case, then I just set marginal benefits equal to marginal costs, which means I set 15 minus Q star equal to five. And then that tells me that Q star is gonna be equal to 10. And if I am I'm interested in then the price then, then I can say that then the price P star is gonna to equal to the marginal benefit evaluated at Q star, which is equal to 15 minus 10, which is equal to five. So this is the quantity and this is the price. So that's price and this is QTY quantity. And uh, the problem with that is that, um, is that Q star will use all of resource in uh, you know, I'll say period one. And I'll erase that little squiggle there. 
And it's all because we know that T is equal to 10. So the total amount is equal to 10. So um, what will happen is that the supplier will realize that a supplier will realize that, that if they price things at five unit or five dollars per unit this year, and they pump enough to be consistent with that price, then what's going to happen is there will be no oil next year. So if you happen to have a little bit of oil left over next year, you can charge almost any price. Well, not almost any price, you can charge the choke price basically. So if you really want to, you can hold off some oil and put it into next year and charge the choke price for it. Now, as you hold off a lot of oil and put it in the next year, then you can you start having to charge less than the choke price next year, but it's still greater than the $5 that you're charging now. So the question is, um, what do we expect these shrewd uh, you know, um, suppliers to do if they're considering both periods? Because they can make more profit, more net present value, if they save some to sell next year when the prices will be higher because the supply is more scarce. So that's what uh, we um, you know, talked about solving for. So for our two period equilibrium, just as a reminder, the marginal benefit is 15 minus Q. The marginal cost is five. The uh, interest rate is 0.2, which means that the beta value, the marginal rate of substitution is 0 0.833. And the total amount available is 10. And so um, we are interested in what is the Q1 star and Q2 star and the corresponding P1 star and P2 star. Um, and then we're going to also be interested in the marginal user cost um, in both years and how they relate to each other. So I'll say delta marginal user cost. So those are the things that we are going to be interested in. And those are the same type of things you'll solve for um, on homework G3. For whatever the homework. Um, I'm sorry, homework, I use the same naming convention in all my classes. And um, so I think what I meant is homework D something or whatever. So whatever the current homework, D2 I think is the right one that's out there. So, th so this will be used on the homework. And so in order for me to solve that, then we learned that the intertemporal equimarginal principle basically says that we equate the net present values of the marginal benefits. So it's the net present value of the net or the marginal net benefit is um, same across periods. So that means that I need to calculate a marginal net benefit function, which is just my marginal benefit minus my marginal cost, which in this case is just 15 minus Q minus five or 10 minus Q. And so I'm saying that if the, um, the net present value of the marginal net benefit at Q1 star is equal to the net present value of the marginal net benefit at Q2 star, which by the way is equal to T minus Q1 star. And so that is the intertemporal equimarginal principle. It's our version of marginal benefits equal marginal cost. And if uh, so, to, to substitute into that, the net present value of present benefits is just the present benefits. And so it's just going to be this marginal net benefit evaluated at Q1 star. So it's just going to be 10 minus Q1 star. And that is now the net present value 
for the next year needs to be discounted by the discount rate. So it needs to be divided by one uh, plus R uh, or multiplied by beta, same thing, multiplied by beta. So that's just equal to um, beta times the marginal net benefit evaluated at T minus Q1 star, which is equal to 0.833 times uh, 10 minus, and then um, T minus Q1 star, where this here is Q2 star. Q2 star. And so now I just have to go through um, a little bit of, um, of algebra. And so remember, t here is equal to 10. So this whole thing on the right-hand side just becomes 10 minus 10 plus q1 star. So a little algebra reminder, uh, you know, when we did a subtraction and we had a quantity, if you, the, the negative inside the quantity turns into a positive. And so that's what gives me uh, on the right-hand side, 0.833 Q1 star, because the tens uh, subtract out. So now I've got 10 minus Q1 star is equal to 0.833 Q1 star. So this here, so I'll say, I'll just bring that down, 10 minus Q1 star. So this, from this formula here, I can then solve for Q1 star. And that gives me a Q1 star of 5.455, which is much less than the 10 that I got in the myopic or static case. And so by the way, this is also called the dynamic efficient equilibrium. This is a side note. So that is much less, so that we are definitely saving things for next year. And so then the question is, how much are we saving for next year? Well, um, that's gonna be 10 minus that. So Q2 star, is going to be equal to, to 4.545. Uh, and these things add up to t equals 10. So we know how much we're going to supply this year and next year. All right, I see a question. In the first equation with beta, where did the Q2 come from? Uh, no problem. Um, in the first equation, where we introduce uh, beta, the Q2 is right here. So um, we're saying, what is the marginal net benefit evaluated at Q2 star? And the Q2 star is just whatever's left over from the total from Q1. So I can just substitute in the, um, the, the Q1. So this, I can write above this, that this quantity is Q2 star. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this before we start? So right now we've calculated um, Q1 star and Q2 star. So we're done with that portion. Now we need to move on to the rest of these. So any other questions on this calculation? All right, all right. By the way, if anyone's curious, um, there, uh, if anyone happens to, you know, like the software package that I use here, um, it's called GoodNotes. Um, I just want to give a little plug to GoodNotes. Um, some people um, ask me about it because they like the laser pointer. 
Um, and, um, and I do too. That's why I use it all the time. So if you're interested in that, good notes, it's uh, you know, um, a, uh, an iOS application that also has a Mac OS desktop version. So I like it for my notes. I use it for a lot of different things. Uh, there are a lot of alternatives, notability and whatever, but if you're interested, check it out. All right, so I've stalled. Any other questions? Does this make sense? All right, so let's calculate those other things, the prices and things. So to calculate the price in year one, that's just equal to the marginal benefit, not the marginal net benefit, the marginal benefit. So that's equal to marginal benefit um, evaluated at Q1 star, which if I go back to my marginal benefit, that's 15 minus Q1 star, which is going to give me a price of 9.545. And the price in the second period is just going to be equal to the marginal benefit at Q2 star, which is equal to 15 minus um, Q2 star, which is going to be equal to 10.455. And so we can see price increases from period one to period two due to scarcity. All right, so that's how we calculate price. Any questions on that? Because the next focus is on this scarcity problem here. And, this, and the question is, that if I can manage to increase the price over time, so then the question is that, well, it sounds like I'm charging a greater price than the cost it takes. So it's kind of like if it's an infinite resource, the competitive equilibrium is gonna force me to charge the cost of extraction for the last unit that I pull out. But for a finite resource, a scarce resource, it suggests that in order to compensate me, for the resource that I'm going to lose in the future years by selling it to you now, then I can charge you for more than my cost of extraction. And so we want to figure out how much more uh, do I get from that. So we calculate the marginal user cost in year one, which is just the difference between the cost and the um, marginal cost of extraction. This here is a constant of five. And so this is going to be a uh, four point five four five is the marginal user cost or scarcity rent. And then the marginal user cost that I raise in year two is the price I charge in year two minus the marginal cost of extracting in year two, which again, it's a constant of equal to five. And so that is going to be five point um, four five five. And so now I'm seeing here that the scarcity rent increases over time. And you can think of this as like interest from the bank. So it's like the oil in the ground is my principal in the bank. And every time, um, but I get interest for every barrel of oil that's in the ground that I'm going to sell in the future. So um, if I sell all the oil this year, then I get lower interest than if I sell some oil next year. And so this is sort of showing me that the longer I leave the oil in the ground, then the higher the interest I get on that oil. So natural resources are natural banks. Part of the reason we encourage suppliers to conserve is because it's in their best interest. They're gonna conserve on their own if it's a private resource because 
it is beneficial to them to have access to something that nobody else has access to because they can then generate rent that rises over time. This is the reason why your rent on your apartment rises over time because there are there's a scarce number of resources so you're limited on where you can get those and so they can charge you more and more and more and if they didn't then they would sell all of their apartments and turn all that money into the bank because the bank would generate more revenue than you do so the reason your rent goes up year after year after year is because if it didn't your landlord would sell your apartment and turn the money into the bank and would make more from the bank interest than they would from you. So this is really uh, an important thing, this, this rent generating aspect of scarcity. Uh, professor? Yes. Um, I, I sort of missed a word, where'd you get um, MUC1 and MUC2 where how MC um, is multiplied by Q1 star to get 4.545, where do you get? <clears throat> oh, this that? isn't multiplied, that, that's evaluated at. Oh, okay. So, MC is a function and that's evaluated at. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry about that. So I guess I could put up here that um, just as a reminder that um, that marginal benefit Q, that notation means 15 minus Q and marginal cost Q equals five. Um, where that just happens to be a constant. But you could imagine that I might make the marginal cost vary based on Q. But for these natural reef, these non-renewable ones, we think about these oil pumps and they, they usually are a fixed cost for every barrel. And that's what we're showing there. Okay. All right, All right so I any- con I was confused for a second, but thank you. Great. Any other questions? All right, so now um, what I'm interested in, interested, that was meant to be a, a pun, um, is how much is this rent changing over time and how does it compare to the interest rate I would get at the bank? So in that case, what I can do is I can calculate the delta MUC, um, which is equal to MUC two, minus MUC one, and then I can divide that whole thing by MUC one to tell me how much does my scarcity rent increase in terms of what the scarcity rent used to be in the previous year. This is kind of like an interest rate. It's almost like I have MUC one in the bank this year, and next year I'm gonna have MUC two in the bank, and I'm trying to see how much interest I've gained. So if I do that calculation, <clears throat> then it's just uh, 5.455 minus 4.545 divided by 4.545. And so that right there is, um, if I do the, the uh, numerator there, that's, um, Oh, sorry, my on-screen calculator is, oh, it's because, so 5.455 minus 4.545 is 0.91. And I divide that by the MUC1, 4.545. And what I find is, that 0.91 divided by 4.545 is around 0 0.2, which is the interest rate. And so this right here is a manifestation of um, hotelings, oh, this right here is a manifestation of Hotelling's rule that at the dynamically efficient equilibrium, the scarcity rent will rise with the prevailing interest rate, which is what we have right here. 
So we're saying that if you are, if you as a supplier of non-renewal resources are maximizing your net present value of all of the benefits you get across the price path of um, you know, what you're charging now versus what you're charging later versus what you're charging again, then what you're gonna find is that your scarcity rent or your marginal user cost is going to grow at the same rate that money would grow in the bank. And that's just, a, it kind of makes sense. Um, basically what we're saying is that the competitive market equilibrium, so we're not a monopoly, we just happen to have a scarcity of a resource. At the competitive market equilibrium, let's say for apartments, then generally, apartment rent is going to climb at the same rate that it would climb if you could put it, let's say, in the money market as a landlord. So it's like a landlord could decide to put their money in the money market and do just as well, but they decided that, well, I'm just, I just decided to get into real estate instead of getting into the money market. But they end up making the same amount of money on the money market or on the, in their real estate as they did in the money market. Because if you could make more on the money market, <clears throat> then everybody, or I'm sorry, more in real estate, but everybody who was in the money market is going to move into real estate. But when they move into real estate, then there will be less scarcity, which will, re which will lower this effect. Um, so that, that will cause people to move back to the money market. So this, this interest rate not only couples everyone who's supplying the non-renewable resource, it's also coupling everyone who could be doing something else. So the fact that money has a natural background growth rate is what sets the growth rate in prices in the non-renewable markets as well. And that's why if you can make money more valuable by making interest rates climb, then people are going to get out of the non-renewable business. And how do they get out of it? They sell all of their private resource. They turn it into money. So if you wanna encourage conservation, then you should um, you know, find a way to encourage low interest rates because high interest rates are going to encourage a move out of natural resource conservation and into money markets. And that's gonna mean the natural resources are gonna get converted into money. Converted into money means being extracted. All right, so that is bringing us up to date with our non-renewable uh, stuff and our discussions there about hotelling's rule. Are there questions? Does that make sense? that the magic of scarcity turns a natural resource into a capital asset that generates increasing returns over time. Anything? If you'd like, I can also uh, show the question slide if you would like to, um, I'm gonna put that in the, uh, in the chat. So if there's something that you're shy about asking here, you can ask there. Uh, in the question slide. All right, so um, haven't done a mid lecture attendance question for a while. So let's go ahead and do one of those. So I'll put up the attendance slide here and I will put the attendance link. It's not the link that I just put in the, the chat. It's the second link, the one that ends in ATT for attendance. And so let's do an attendance question of, um, of if I have an interest rate of uh, 25%, um, what do I expect or how, if I have an interest rate of 25% and a scarcity rent this year of $100, what is my scarcity rent next year? And I'm not looking for uh, you know, correct answers in the attendance question, just coherent answers. So just give kind of your guess of how to do that one. And I can even give you the answer in a minute. Um, in fact, what I want you to do is put your answer into the attendance exercise, but also put your answer into the chat, but don't hit enter yet. And so in a, in a second here, I will tell everyone to hit enter. So for now, the enter key is lava. Um, so um, put your answer into the chat, let it sit there. And then in a second, I'll ask everybody to hit enter at the same time. And if you'd like to correct your answer in the attendance question, that's fine. 
because again, I'm not grading for correctness in the attendance question, just completion and coherence. Um, so think about your answer, put in the chat and go ahead and hit enter and tell me what you think the answer is here. So again, uh, scarcity rent this year is $100. The interest rate is 25%. So what will be the scarcity rent next year if I'm at the dynamically efficient equilibrium? And I will wait. I refuse to believe that you guys all tuned in and then walked away. Maybe some of you, but I, I think some of you are out there. I hope I can feel your eyes. Gotcha. So there's a lack of confidence in the answers. That's fine. And I think there's probably the, um, that's, that's great. Um, wrong answers are fine. Um, wrong answers help me. Um, so, um, so that's great. I'm seeing some answers pop in right now. Some 75s, some 125s, 125s. So a lot of the 25 answers. And 125 is what I'm looking for. So my answer is 125. And the reason is that the scarcity rent will go up over time because of the increasing scarcity because I've used some of the resource this year, I use some of the resource next year, but when I use some of the resource next year, there will be less available next year because of what I use this year. So that must mean that I can high, charge a higher premium for it next year. So you know it's gotta go up. You know it's, um, no, don't submit it yet. We'll submit it at the end of the class. So this will be question one answer, and then there might be a couple others. So, so that's the idea here is that the, um, by hotelling's rule, then what we are expecting is that if you could take that $100, and, uh, and it's fine if you've already submitted, just um, submit a second uh, when, you, when we do the next attendance exercise, you can just fill your original answer in for question one and then question two with the two submissions I can merge when I process the attendance. Um, but, um, so, um, but the idea here between hotelling's rule is that 100 bucks that you made this year, um, you, could, you can say you can take the 100 bucks and put it into the bank and it will then make 25% interest and it'll come back and be $125. What we're saying is that if we've managed our resources efficiently, then what we sell next year will be naturally worth the same amount we would make if we would have taken that same quantity and put it in the bank and had it appreciate for a year in the bank. So if the bank is growing at 25%, so is the scarcity rent is growing at 25%. So those two things have to come to, come to match. And we refer to this, by the way, as a no arbitrage condition. So I'll write that condition a little bit better. And we will see that a lot um, as we move forward in looking at these renewable resources. So arbitrage describes when you take advantage of a difference in prices across uh, two different contexts. And so you might notice that um, you know, squishy green balls sell for a particular price in Arizona and they sell for a different price in Ohio. And so if, you, what you can do is you could go into the state where you can buy them at a lower price and then sell them in the state where you can sell them at a higher price. And you make a profit just by moving from one market to the other. That's what we refer to as arbitrage, is when you take advantage of a difference in value from in two different spaces that you have access to. And so what we expect is in efficient markets, there will be these no arbitrage conditions. So this is the case where we're expecting the returns from natural resource management should match the returns from putting your money in the money market. Because if they didn't match, you'd have people shifting <clears throat> from one to the other to make a profit. 
And so the no arbitrage condition is kind of a no profit from trading from one to the other. And so the equimarginal principle is sort of a statement of no arbitrage as well. So you will hear this term, no arbitrage condition. It means I, I can't move an asset from one category into another and make it money just by moving it. If I move a barrel of oil from the ground into the bank, I will make the same interest as waiting a year and selling it next year. So either I sell an oil, a barrel of oil this year and put it in the bank, or I wait a year and sell it. And I will make the same amount of money next year, regardless of which one I do. So that's a no arbitrage condition. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so I think we are ready for new material then. So, um, so we have handled the non-renewable and so now let's move into renewables. So in these private non-renewable resources that kind of naturally come to an efficient equilibrium, we don't really have to, we don't have to inject regulation. So we don't have to tax the suppliers to get them to do um, the socially efficient thing because they care about their private resource being available, then they naturally kind of do the socially efficient thing. Not so for a lot of, of renewable resources and also not so for things like aquifers. Large groundwater aquifers are so large that there's no private ownership. And so um, I guess I wanna emphasize, you know, that um, property rights are so important here. So property rights give us a natural efficiency. So a large ground uh, water aquifer is, um, is going to be available freely to, it's gonna be an open access resource. And because it's an open access resource, then people don't think about the depletion effects um, for other people. So you end up the, the, in the oil or coal case, the negative externalities of depletion are not actually externalities because I'm depleting my own supply. But for an aquifer, I'm depleting someone else's supply. And so that externality is not priced into my decision making. And so because I don't care about depleting someone else's access to the aquifer, aquifer then we get a socially inefficient management of underground or of groundwater aquifers, where we get a naturally socially efficient uh, uh, allocation in the oil and coal and natural uh, gas case. But for the aquifers, we might need to, to regulate in order to get people, we might need to, to tax people or charge people to, um, to account for this so that they don't overuse the resource and use it all up this year and not leave any for next year. So that's kind of what we're gonna start talking about um, for, uh, for renewable resources as well. So property rights, you know, the fact that they were privately owned resources um, give you um, efficiency for free efficiency without regulation. Okay. So new chapter. So chapter seven. Um, now we're, we're interested in renewable. resources. And so this, uh, the rest of the lecture here is just going to be kind of an intro to this. And then we will go into the more detailed models from chapter seven in the next lecture. So, um, so for, for now, so these renewable resources that we're focusing on are things like, uh, you know, timber farms. So, um, you know, what, you know, you can have woodlots, uh, which are sources for timber farming. And, you know, they naturally grow. Um, and that also gives them a kind of bank like characteristic. 
because you get a natural compound interest that you get from them renewing themselves. And so the question, uh, but it actually introduces a, a, an even stronger intertemporal trade-off. So in this case, growth induces um, a, uh, an intertemporal trade-off because you have choices here. Do I harvest or wait for more growth? So this is kind of the cool thing about natural resources is with the scarce case, a little bit of extraction generates um, there is incentive to extract now because you can get money now for that extraction, but it also generates growth in the money you can get next year because there will be even more scarcity next year. So scarcity generates revenue opportunities, but, net, but growth, which is like the opposite of scarcity. So a, a renewable resource itself also generates these trade-offs and opportunities here because you can sell what you've got now, or if you just wait a year, if the growth rate is high enough, you might have a whole lot more later. So if the later growth of your trees grows so much that they grow far more than money in a bank account could ever grow, then rather than selling all your trees now and putting them in the bank, it's better to let your trees grow and then harvest them later in a larger volume. And if you can sell that larger volume, you make much more money than you would have by selling the smaller volume and then trying to get interest off of it in a bank or a money market. So um, growth actually creates this trade-off where you're not quite sure how much do I do now or how much do I wait for later. Um, the other interesting thing that happens here is that um, you can there are... Um, alternative uses for, uh, you know, in this case, the woodlot, uh, or just in general land on which you have a natural resource. So for example, you know, a parking lot is one example, but also species habitat. or uh, park, recreation. So somehow in our analysis, we have to account for, I'm gonna put this in here, we have to account for growth and we have to account for um, uh, alternative uses for land. And then we also have to account for alternative uses for the natural resource, all three of those. So if I destroy the woodlot um, and put up a parking lot, I can then charge people to park at that parking lot. So, but I've gotten rid of the natural resource entirely. So that's what I mean by an alternative uses for the land. Alternatively, if I, um, and there's a question in the chat, I'll get to that in a second. Alternatively, if I leave up the woodlot, but don't harvest it, then the woodlot becomes a home for species and it might increase species richness, which has certain ecological benefits that might be important for neighboring farms, for example. So maybe there'll be bees that help pollinate those farms, for example, or there's all sorts of other you know, biodiversity benefits out of that. Uh, or parks, you know, people can come through the woodlot and they can treat it as a park. They can walk around, they can jog. Uh, maybe I can charge entry for that park or maybe the government can pay me um, for the enjoyment of this park um, because, um, uh, you know, the government might pay me for the land and, uh, and then, you know, other people can then, you know, the citizens can walk through it. So, um, so those things need to be accounted for here. There's a question of, do we need to take into account labor? And, um, and labor will be in some ways uh, accounted for that. And we'll get to that, uh, but because you can think about how, 
how costly is it to cut down the trees? Well, what we do is we end up just thinking of a net benefit. And so we think about the price that we're gonna get for selling the lumber, selling the timber, and we're gonna subtract off the cost it took to actually cut down each tree. And when we consider both of those together, it's almost as if the net benefit is like a, a price we get as if uh, it was totally free to do that. So we are going to account for labor, but in the end, it's just folded into kind of like as if we could charge less per tree. So we will get to that, but it, it just ends up being like a subtraction on a term and it doesn't actually make that much of a difference, but it is important. So thanks for that question. All right, any other questions about this general idea? And so we're going to start with models where we only focus on growth and then we're going to gradually add in these other things. So we're actually then going to add in, yeah, add in this one first and then we're gonna add in this one. Okay. All right. So for now, let's uh, consider a private landowner um, of, uh, let's say, a woodlot And, uh, you know, so this, they've got, you know, um, a stand of trees. And the question is, how long do we allow, how long do we allow trees to grow until harvesting and repeating the cycle. And so basically what you can imagine is that over a long period of time, you're going to have tree growth. So this would be like volume of wood or trees and you know wood in trees. And you're gonna have that there's gonna be some growth function. So there's some function of growth. And then there will be some point of time where there is a harvest. And then that's gonna restart the cycle. So we get a growth function and then another harvest, and then another growth function and so on. So, and so these are uh, referred to as rotations. And the general um, problem of deciding how long a rotation is going to be is a, an optimal aging problem. And so uh, you can imagine that we have that this here represents, um, you know, new, I'll say baby forest. And this is um, over here is old for, um, you know, mature forest. So how old do we allow the forest to get before we chop it all down and replant to get a young forest again? So that's what we call it an optimal aging problem. And so, these models, this here, there's gonna be a lot of biology involved in figuring out what this function is. And so in order to figure out the optimal rotation length, so that's what we're trying to figure out is um, best 
rotation length, then we have to use biological models coupled with economic reasoning. And so the resulting models are known as bioeconomic models. Okay. So that's an outline of the basic, go, go ahead. Oh, this is like a random question. I'm just curious about it. For a certain, um, uh, like like plant life or tree life, is there a certain like an automated system where it's sensor, uh, where uh, there's like sensors of, it reached like a like an optimal length and then you can just chop the tree down and, and, and then start the whole process again? Well, so that's so that's what we need to figure out is is what do we mean by optimal in an economic sense? So, um, and and that's what we're about to kind of get into here. But you you might have a tool that allows you to tell that a tree has reached its maximum height, and and for that point into the future, um, it's actually maybe going to. Um, senesce, if you will, you know, it's going to stop growing and, and you better chop it down there. But that's if you wanted the maximum amount of wood from that particular tree. If you want the uh, maximum amount of wood uh, over the entire period here, you might get a slightly different answer. If you want the maximum net present value over all of these periods, you might get a totally different answer. So, um, so that's kind of what we're, we're getting into here is how to, how to define that. But, um, but we do need that data. So ideally you would sort of like, you would have some way of, um, let's say you've, you've some scientists, some natural resource scientists went out there and they figured out there's a correlation between uh, canopy coverage and growth rate. And so if you knew that correlation, then you could then fly drones over top of large you know, forests and then you could then use the canopy coverage to give you an estimate of these growth functions over time. Mm. And, um, and so you then fly those out and, uh, and eventually you see, you know, every month you watch this thing grow and eventually you get to a point where you decide that, that, uh, that you know, maybe this thing grows slowly at first and then it starts rapidly growing and then, you know, peters off again. And if you let it keep growing, it would look like this and then come back down. And so you decide that, well, okay, we're gonna harvest it right here based on models that we'll talk about. Okay. Does that answer your question? Do you see kind of where we're going with it? Yeah, I see where we're going, yep. Great. All right, so let's get exactly into that. Are there any other questions? Okay, so let's assume that those nice natural resource scientists have gone ahead and they have built some of those models for us. And they can tell us that um, the volume of a particular stand of forest grows over time according to some function. And they might give us a function. And, and so this is gonna be like the most sophisticated looking function that we've worked on so far, but don't worry, we're not gonna, we don't have to we're not gonna do a lot of calculus or a whole lot of arithmetic with this one. It's mainly there to drive the graph that I'm gonna show here. And it's something you could at least arithmetically uh, derive, even if we, you know, like, you know, we might use calculus in a more advanced class to solve these problems, but um, what you could do in this one on your kind of spare time. But for those of you who aren't comfortable with that, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything of that. But so this function V of T where V is the volume, um, might look like something that like this. This like they they did a statistical regression and they figured out that this function ends up being a good fit to the data that they got from forest growth over time. And so our question is what what does that look like? Well, if I plot that thing, So I'm gonna plot this V of T, this volume of, you know, so you can think of this again as the um, amount of wood in a stand of forest 
that I manage, a privately owned stand of forest. And what I find is that after I chop everything down and let things grow, it always follows this on average, this pattern. And that pattern is going to um, kind of start a little bit slow. And then it's going to curve up a little bit and then it's gonna reach some maximum point and then it's gonna start falling back down. And so, uh, you know, you've got this slow growth period and then uh, rapid growth and then decline, or I'll say slow, you know, slow, slow growth again maybe. And then eventually we get decline. And that's just a picture. If you were to plot this thing out, that's what you would end up getting. So if you look at this, you'd say, well, the maximum, maybe I'll use a different color. So you might say, well, right here, this shows me that um, I've got some T max that um, if I wait for that long, then on average, I will get the maximum amount of wood I can get out of my, um, of, of this stand. But the question is, is it worth waiting that long? Because I'm not trying to maximize the amount of wood from an individual um, rotation. I'm trying to maximize the amount of wood over all rotations. And rotations take time. And if I look at this, then what I see is that there is a period of fast growth right here. You can think of this, this is like a bunch of banks into one. These, this is like a bank with a low interest rate. This is a bank with a high interest rate. This is a bank with a low interest rate. And this is a bank that loses your money. So this is a bank where your principal goes away over time. So you definitely don't wanna the, put your money in this bank. But if you have the opportunity, you want to put your money in this bank, but you want to avoid this bank up here. So in reality, it's probably better for me to cut the trees down somewhere um, in the middle here, because I want to kind of ride this out. At the point where I get the slow growth out here, it's probably better for me to replant and try to get my trees back into the fast growth phase instead. So. Um, so to, I guess, put that um, another way, I'm deciding how far I want to go here. So to, to think about that another way, if you think about our picture of the biological rotations over long periods of time, long time, then the question is, how long is this rotation supposed to be, TR? And knowing that I am going to repeat TR, so if the total length of time is, we'll call it time, and each individual rotation we'll call TR. And so there's this growth period and then the same growth period and the same growth period and the same growth period. So we're repeating this over and over again. And the amount of wood that we get at the end of each one of these is gonna be equal to the volume function above evaluated at TR. Now, over the entire time period, the amount of wood that I'm gonna get over the full time period here is going to be the volume of TR 
times the total time, let me see if I can write this in a better place where I have more space. So it'll be the volume of TR times time divided by TR, where this here is the number of rotations. So this here, if I want to maximize wood over time, then I actually am interested in maximizing this quantity, which is the volume that I get at the end of each period times the number of periods. And I hope what you can see here is that the longer you allow TR to go, so let's say TR was somewhere here. This is our hypothetical TR. The advantage of the shorter TR is I get more periods of time in. If I let TR go longer, it's true that I milk each rotation for more wood. I get more wood out of each rotation. But for any long interval of time, I get less rotations. So there is a trade-off between, um, so I can put trade-off, between number of rotations and uh, wood per rotation. And so if I get more wood per rotations, I get less number of rotations. If I get more numbers of rotations, I necessarily get less wood. So if I'm interested in maximizing the amount of wood that I generate over time, then what's best to do? Well, if I remember that formula, so the formula here for so my wood over time is equal to the volume at the end, so this is volume evaluated at the end of a rotation, times time divided by the rotation length. Well, that's equivalent of saying the volume I'll make that a little x to be a times. That's equivalent to me moving the length of the rotation under the total amount uh, that I get out of each rotation. And so these two expressions are identical. But what I see here in this other version is that maximizing this long value here, if I if time is fixed, if I say over 100 years, how do I get the maximum amount of wood? Well, if the 100 years is fixed, then what I'm actually maximizing is this thing. So um, to, what I'm saying here is to maximize total amount of wood, then choose rotation length TR to maximize this V, the volume per rotation divided by the rotation time. And this here is referred to as the mean annual increment. I'll write that below. Otherwise known as the MAI. And so maximizing the MAI maximizes the total amount of the renewable resource that you get over a long stretch of time with multiple rotations of renewal. And so this is referred to as the biological rotation. Because you are maximizing the total yield 
of the, the natural resource. So we have not worried about how much the resource costs and we have not worried about the time value of money. Um, all we focused here is on um, the just max amount of wood over this pattern. And so where, how does that look based on the T max I showed you before? Well, if I um, were to go back to this plot right here, then, and maybe I'll just redraw this plot on a clean plot. So I'm just gonna draw a new axis. And so this is T and I'm gonna plot V of T. Uh, and so that is going to look like a curve which rises slowly at first and then rapidly rises and then starts to decline like that. And I said before that a naive choice would be to wait this long T max, which would maximize the amount of wood generated in a rotation, but it has the side effect of reducing the number of rotations we can shove into any unit of time. Well, if I want to maximize the, the MAI, which is equal to the VT over T, then if I think about it, this, if I were to draw a line, okay, connecting these two, the slope of that line is equal to its mean annual increment. So that's equal to V T max divided by T max. That's the slope of that line right there because up here, this is equal uh, to V T max on the Y axis and uh, T max on the X axis, all right? If you look at that line, then the question is, how do I get the maximum slope while staying on the green line? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this line and we're gonna rotate it up until it reaches a point of tangency right here. And that point of tangency where we've rotated up has the maximum slope. And that will be the point which, which is the biological rotation, which maximizes the MAI. So, um, so that's what I'll do is I'll draw a second line here. No, it doesn't like, uh, it won't snap to where I want it to snap to, which is annoying. So maybe I'll hand draw that instead. All right, one more time. There we go, that's what I wanted. And so this point right here, that point of tangency That, I'll call it TR, the, the slope here of this curve is VTR divided by TR. And it is the largest, this is the max slope, which means it also is the max MAI. And so this here, is our biological rotation. And as you can see, it is shorter than the 
length, if you wanted to maximize the total amount per rotation, you would wait longer. And so this reflects the trade-off that you want to pack in as many rotations as possible. And so you're going to instead try to stay on the high interest rate part of the curve and avoid the low interest rate part of the curve in order to get more uh, rotations in where each rotation earns more interest, basically. So we will start here and revisit this starting next lecture. This is just an intro to where we're going. So with that, uh, let me give you one last attendance question and then I'll switch back to that for those of you who are taking uh, notes. Um, so I'll put the attendance link in the chat as well. You said that second line is called the um, VTR. Um, the, well, the second line is the slope of that second line is VTR over TR. Okay, okay. Um, so, but the, where TR we call the biological rotation. All right, so the attendance question that I have for you, um, which I think gave you the right link in the chat, is, um, is what does MAI stand for? So the question is, what does MAI stand for? And that's all I've got for you. So if you don't have anything else for me, you can feel free to, to head out. Uh, otherwise, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. And have a nice weekend for those of you who are taking off. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Could you go back two slides briefly? Sure. Thanks. There? Yes, perfect. OK, thank you. Have a good weekend. Sure. You too. All right, looks like that's everybody pretty much. So I will go ahead and end the meeting and um, hope everybody has a good weekend.